record on this computer. There we go. So we are now recording. Uh, feel free to chat about uh, any kind of asynchronous or, or sort of content that you upload to your Econostoga shells. Um, what does that currently look like? What kind of activities or, or uh, content do you kind of put up there? Anyone, anyone brave enough to, to hop in? I'll, I'll talk. <laughs> Um, I, um, my content tends to be, I post articles, so it's pretty stagnant, you know, um, a lot of text. I write a lot to my students. I try to be funny in my text so that they'll engage, but, um, I, I would say that it's pretty, uh, is one dimensional possible on Econostoga? It's kind of one dimensional. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, that's brave. That's typically what we see too, right? I love that you're trying to engage students through the way you frame it as well. Yeah. yeah. And, and that can make, yeah. make all the difference too, right? Like putting, a, putting up readings and, and, you know, using some of these tools to, you know, add some guiding questions or something like that. Um, like that's, that's still more than, um, than nothing, you know, and it's, it, can, it can help um, make that, those readings a little bit more meaningful for students for sure. Nice. Sherry in the chat is saying she's used some HTML templates. Um, there was just a workshop on that earlier today, I think, or later today, sometime today, and again on Thursday. Uh, similar interactives like accordions, tables, etc. but these are much cooler. Um, and then wants to know what the difference between H5P and these tools are. And I would probably say ease of use and ease of learning, learning curve as well. Yeah, Rob, any more comments about the difference between what we're showing today and H5P? Yeah, yeah, I guess it, it's... Um... Very similar functionality in a lot of ways. Um, I, I think the main thing would be that these tools are, are also, yeah, a little bit easier to edit, um, a little bit easier for our team to support because um, it, because they were kind of built by um, our development team. It is using kind of libraries and code that that, that our developers are, are pretty familiar with. Um, so if there's a situation in which you, you run into a snag or something like that, you can put in a request to uh, Econostoga and, and get some support with some of these tools. Nice. Yeah, and Christian is saying he's used the uh, YouTube link tie-in. Yeah, the, the augmented YouTube video. Um, definitely a popular one. And I know we're, they're kind of transitioning over to Panopto as the option for that, as there are some issues with YouTube uh, specifically, as Christian mentions there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for the, for the kind words, Jennifer. Oh, nice. And Sarah's Ooh, saying timeline. timeline to do dialogue simulation. Yeah, I love that. It's one of the, the, the things that we don't always think about with the timeline. That's what we use for the agenda. A lot of people just think historical, chronological order or a process, but I love the conversation or the dialogue, especially in a, like a healthcare program or a language program would be great. Yeah. Oh, and Alan is saying quizzes can be used for formative assessments, but can be confusing to students when the quiz tool is used for non-graded activities, which is so true. And Alan is kind of previewing to uh, our what's coming. Alan knows what's coming. We're not going to be featuring the practice questions uh, tool today in our workshop, but that will be coming in the next couple of weeks. We just want to make sure that it's uh, perfect for the students and easy to use for you as well. All right, Rob, did we want to chat about the diagram next tool, which is kind of our sure. next one we're showcasing? Yeah, I, why, don't we, why don't we start with that? Do you want to, is that, who's yeah, this can, one? Is this one, is this yours, is me? <laughs> That's what, switch oh, up all your name the time. To it. Yeah, it's got your name next to it. <laughs> That's all right. We wanted to kind of review the existing tools or what we would call kind of the legacy or established tools. Tools that have been out for a couple of years first, and then we were going to focus more on the tools that are new in the suite, and we'll do some demos here. So right now we're using what's called the Diagram Next tool, which is one of our new tools to showcase the existing tools. And this one typically shows steps in a process paired with an image. We've kind of streamlined this a little bit so that we don't have an image. We're just using it as a list that students can click through with some points. So the first one that we've already seen today during the housekeeping were accordions or collapsible panels. And that's a really great way to chunk information and you don't, that you don't really mind what order students will access it in. So unlike the idea expander, which Rob and I used for our introductions, that is a specific order. Accordion students can kind of have some more autonomy about which one they choose first. 
Our next tool is the YouTube video with interaction, as Christian's already mentioned here. Um, this gives you some overlays onto YouTube, and it's an existing tool right now that we're using to kind of fill some gaps until people become more familiar with Panopto. And I believe that we're um, suggesting that Panopto become your go-to for video augmentation rather than the YouTube uh, video with interaction tool here. The next one's a pie graph data with uh, visualization, I guess. So uh, much like it suggests, we're looking at building a pie graph here. Very common use case would be to showcase your evaluation or grades breakdown, but you could also do results of a survey that you took in a synchronous session um, or to show some data, maybe from one of your articles, Laura, to kind of just bring that to life, right? Now, here's a supplementation. You've got a visual, I'll put some time into it. Our next tool is the timeline sequence presentation, which you saw us use for our agenda today. Um, and some people have been making comments. Yeah, Sarah is saying as a dialogue or a process or a chronology. Um, I particularly like the timeline tool to break down or to show students a roadmap of a multi-phase project, especially if it's a group project, because sometimes students get confused that the contract and the proposal and the draft and the final and the reflection all are part of the same project. So you can show them in one place here on a timeline. Our next tool is the Progress Snapshot Reporting Tool, which is an eConestoga content management tool. And if you've gone to any of Nathan's sessions, he may have featured this one there. This is a really great tool for students to know where they are in a course. Um, this is paired really well with the what if grade calculator, which may be our last one. Uh, yes, yeah, so they kind of go yep. hand in hand, right? So the progress snapshot kind of shows students where they're at right now, so they don't have to go into the grade book and figure that out. And then the what if calculator uh, tool is paired with that to say, what do I need to get on my remaining assignments or outstanding assignments in order to get the grade that I'd like in the course? So this can help you uh, facilitate some kind of end of term or midterm type conversations with students. Mm -hmm. um I know the next one we have is, is flip cards, but I was just, I just wanted to kind of give people a sense of what the, the instructor tools uh, shell actually looked like, because we are kind of making some distinction between sort of course management and content creation. Um, so a little bit of free jazz from our, our agenda here, but. Uh, Perfect. Um, yeah, so this is the Econ Saga instructor tools shell. You should all have access to that. There is kind of two separate tabs here for course management and content creation. Um, so under course management, we've got the dy dynamic instructional uh, plan page, uh, which we'll be showcasing a little bit later. Uh, the essential elements scanner tool, which we've, we've just talked about. Uh, there's also a tool that will just create um, Microsoft Teams, uh, like basically create a connection, uh, a, a separate Microsoft team based on your course shell. Um, the main thing is you just need to log in to your, your, your course shell and then um, use this tool to connect it and it will automatically create the team for you. you. You can't just go and create one in your own teams to the best of my knowledge. But um, if you'd rather use teams to connect with students, use that for some kind of live chat or, or whatever, uh, that's, that's certainly an option there. Uh, and this is the progress uh, snapshot and the what if calculator tool. Um, and then if you scroll up to the top here under content creation, we actually have a search function as well because uh, we've added a whole bunch of them. And then this is where you've got all the different uh, the tools that we'll be talking about. Uh, but the next one is flip cards. Oh, wait. Did flip cards get. Yeah, I was actually going to walk through how you would use the Econostoga instructor tools to create flip cards. And I've done a little bit of pre work in advance. So I've got everything ready for myself to just cut and paste in there. So I'm going to take over oh, okay. the screen share if that's yeah, all right. I will stop sharing. All right. Okay, so one of the, oh, I'm on three monitors and it's not letting me know which of those screens I'm sharing. Let's try this again. I'm jealous of your three monitors. Oh yeah. Are you, uh, are you all seeing my uh, Econostoga instructor tools? Perfect. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So one of the first things that I wanted to say before I even start showing you how to use the tool is there is a reason why I have done everything offline so I can cut and paste it in. And that is that when you're creating the tools, there is no save function. So you have to do everything in one go. So much like we kind of advise students writing a discussion post on Econostoga to save their work first and then copy and paste it in, I'm going to suggest the same thing. So from the Econostoga instructor tool site, I'm gonna to go to the content creation tab. I'm gonna scroll down to flip cards. 
From here, you can view some example pages and you can use them as templates if you would like. And we're constantly kind of updating what you can do with these. And you can also see a walkthrough video. So there's a walkthrough or demo video for each of the tools. And yeah, there. So we got a Panopto link there. Just in case you forget how to do it or want some more advice. If you don't want the demo video, you can click on get started. And you're, you're taken directly to this screen here, right to the tool. So every page needs a title. And basically what you're doing with these tools is you're creating a new screen, a separate kind of content or, or screen that appears uh, in Econestoga. Right now, we don't have the ability to have a screen and then embed your tool into an existing screen. So you're kind of creating a standalone screen here. But we can have the flip cards and we can have some information before and after the flip cards to let students know what to do with them. So I'm just gonna do a sample here to tell you the difference between synchronous and asynchronous learning or content and the types of, uh, the types of content you might get in hybrid courses or what the difference is. I love an introduction to each activity. Um, you probably wouldn't just put flip cards in front of a student in a classroom and then just tell them to go. You wanna give them some instructions. So um, here we're just kind of introducing that hybrid courses uh, combine the best of both synchronous and asynchronous content and uh, we'll learn how to maximize the potential of each modality with the cards below. So here's where we actually get into the cards. Now, now here's where we kind of have to think like a developer. We have to think about the, the width of a screen here. So size 12 is the whole width of a screen. I'm gonna be doing two cards and I want them side by side. So I need to divide 12 by two and I get six. That should have my cards sit side by side. Really try to think about how many cards you want on a screen. I mean, they will let you put four cards side by side on a screen. But I mean, I just mentioned that I've got three monitors. It might not be a problem for me to look at, but some students using a smaller laptop. So um, always preview and kind of think about how the user would interact with these. Uh, and you might just want to do two sets and, and have them spread out a little bit more. Also, um, I, I'm pretty sure the, uh, the page that it generates is responsive. So if a student is on a mobile device, it'll check that. And so you may not have a perfect side by side for them because they're obviously they phone screen is much smaller. So what it'll do is it'll just stack the cards uh, accordingly. That's an excellent point, Rob. I know that our department always tries to design for mobile instead of desktop because we know that over 43% of our students access Econestoga through their phones. Okay, so try to keep that in mind. Our, uh, these tools will automatically resize things for mobile device um, if, if your student is accessing it that way. To configure my first card, I'm gonna select the title and we're kind of using an accordion here in our own tool, right? So I've selected the title and opened it up. I want my first card to talk about in-person or synchronous learning. So I'll put that in the title. It's always good practice to have the title on the front of the card and the back of the card. So I'm just going to scroll down and paste it into the back of the card as well. I love flip cards with images. Um, there's a number of different ways we can use them. There's question and answers. Maybe that does not require an image. But for this one, I'm going to use an image from Unsplash, which is a free kind of copyright compliant. And I wanna show you a trick here. I'm not using the URL of the site where the image is. I am right clicking on the image and copying the image address. So it takes me directly there. You might wanna put that in your notes. All of the tools are like this. You need the image address. So that's a right click and copy image address, not the URL of the page that hosts the image or else you're gonna get quite a lot of errors trying to make these tools. So I'm gonna copy that one in to my card image address. We know that for accessibility purposes, for every image we include, we need to include alternative text as well. And that is a picture of the backs of three students as seen from the back of the classroom. I don't really want any other words on the front of the card. And on the back of the card, I could have another image if I wanted, but for my particular use case, I just want some words, right? So it tells me a little bit about um, what in-person or synchronous learning is like. Now I could create my second card right now, or I could preview to see if that first one turned out really well. So you can hop back and forth between the build and preview tabs um, and you won't lose anything unless you have internet problems. So I kind of like to check as I'm going. If I click on the card, it's got exactly what I think. My title's on both the front and the back. 
and my content that says uh, in person sessions are usually used to introduce or reinforce key ideas or for discussions or collaboration. I'm going to go back to the build page and create a second card. So with a lot of our tools, you'll see an add new card or add new item button, and that'll give you a second card. You can always delete them if you've created one by accident or created too many, or you can move them up and down to, to change the, uh, the order that they appear. For my second card, I'm gonna be talking about asynchronous or anytime learning. I'll put that title on the front and the back. I've got an image address for this one, one of my favorites of a, a student studying anytime. I'll right click to copy the image address. Ah, Sarah's got a question. I love this. The, the images we need to use need to be online, not from a file, except for the timeline ones. I believe that every one of the tools needs an online image. So they're looking for an address with alt text. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, I believe the timeline you're able to upload from your computer. Yeah, you have experience with the timeline too, right? So it's probably why you're asking <laughs> a little bit different. Yeah. Don't forget my alt text, the student studying at bed, on their bed. And I need some text for the back. All right, so I only want two cards. I don't need a summary after, but you might want to tell students what they'll be doing with this information, or maybe if they're looking at practice questions or quizzing type feature, um, you can let them know that this information will be on the test or you'll take it up in the next synchronous session. The next button at the bottom of the screen will always take you to the next tab at the top of the screen. So I can go there by the clicking next or by preview page. And I've got my two flip cards. If you want to edit them, you can always go back to build page, but I think they're ready to go. I've spent a little bit of time on this already. Maybe you've noticed. <laughs> so I can go to next or add page to course. And here's where your screen's going to look a little bit different than mine, because you probably don't have dozens and dozens of courses that you're an instructor on, right? So this, this list is going to bring up a list of all of your current courses. You can add your tool to more than one course at a time. So I'm going to add it to both sections of this workshop. Note that before you add your tool to a course, you already need to have an existing module built in your course. You need some place for your tool to live. It can't just float randomly in your course. So Rob's created a week one. I'll put it into week one of each of those. And I love that it lets me hide from students because maybe I want to play around with it before students get to see it. Maybe I'm in a live section where students are actually engaging with the material and I don't want them to see it quite yet, right? <laughs> and then I'll export to listed courses. As soon as you see the yellow bar and export complete and they give you a list of links, that's kind of your success message that you have added to the courses com uh, correctly. So we're in section one right now. Let's check out section one. As Rob was mentioning before, you'll always get an edit this page button with a message that says learners will not see this. If you are the author, you can always edit it at any time, but learners won't see this. My cards work, that's really great. Nice, and I can find that in week one. Let's say I've landed here and I don't like what's happening with some of the, the content. I need to revise it. I can go back to edit the page and it'll take me directly back to the tool builder and it will upload all of my content automatically so I can start from there. So what that also means is that you can load an existing flip cards page from someplace else or an existing tool page from someplace else. Let's say your colleague made some flip cards you really, really like. You can uh, paste the URL from their Econistoga shell and use them as a starting point if you'd like to, so you don't have to start from scratch. So we really encourage you to share uh, if you're creating with your teaching team or with your other colleagues, so that you don't need to start from scratch here. I haven't changed anything, um, but let's pretend that I did. I wanna add it to my course again. Um, and then we'll get to Sherry's question right after this. Um, if I've made revisions, I can replace my existing topic to overwrite the screen or I can create a second page if I want both of them, if I've made significant changes. I'm going to replace this time. And we'll go back to section one. 
So Sherry had a good question. If you hide it, if you hide the tool, can you unhide it from the location you send it to, or do you need to go back to the tool? It's the exact same as unhiding or making visible any content in Econostoga. You'll navigate back to the module or the place it is in Econostoga. You see, I've got a couple versions of this. The, the eye icon with the slash says that it's hidden from students right now. If I want students to see it, I just click on it and make it visible. It's a great question, Sherry. So that was flip cards, a whirlwind tour of flip cards there. You'll kind of see maybe through the process why I advise that you have all your pictures lined up and all of your content lined up um, so that you're, you're kind of, you're really ready to go there. Um, there were a lot of uh, demos and samples of me with pictures of cats just testing things out. So I really suggest that if you are just playing with these, maybe you try an easier piece of your content or more straightforward, or you just go crazy and talk about cats all the time. Something, some, something fun and easy. Were there any questions about flip cards or can anybody think about, did we, did we spur any ideas, any light bulb moments about where you might be able to use these in your course? No? I would love to hear from at least one person about how you think you might be able to use flip cards in your course. Hey, like I didn't even know they existed. <laughs> <laughs> Super fresh, so. yeah. <laughs> Ellen? Uh, I could see them being used precisely for uh, the alternative to the, the quiz piece, um, especially if you can add a caption underneath the image. You could ask a question on one side and then flip around to the other side. So um, either this or that, or a multiple choice, or a... Um, what's in this picture, identify something in this image, and it's a formative assessment that, that won't be recorded, but can be for learners to gauge their learning. Yeah, very nice, kind of replacing the paper flip cards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I love it. And Joanna's saying comparisons or cause-effect scenarios. I've definitely done this, right? So here's the cause and the effect is on the back, any kind of pairing, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, definition terms, we've used them for definitions as well. Yeah, lots of great ideas here. All right, so those were flip cards. Yeah. And now Rob is going to chat a little bit about one of the content management tools or uh, a really, really zazzy dynamic instructional plan. Uh, wow, you can really sell it here. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's fantastic. Any, any IP that updates like fairly automatically is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm gonna hop into I, I've kind of prepared a, a, a rough version of this. Uh, obviously, we're, we're zoomed in a little bit, so the, the background image there is a little pixelated. But um, so yeah, this is essentially um, this is a, a tool that Nathan put together and, and was showing off. Um, oh, is audio possible for the flip cards? Uh, question from Sarah. I don't. I don't think that we've uh, experimented with that. I think the main thing is. is if you were to click on the on the card to have it play, it would flip back over again, um, just because it kind of only understands one kind of input there. Yeah, that's a good um, point. Same with hyperlinks. You can't put a hyperlink out on a flip card because it's basically like you're you only get to click once on a flip card, and that's to turn it over. Yeah. So yeah, that's a great question. Okay. Um, so yeah, this is a, a tool that Nathan put together and is sort of to get around the, I, I think, the the challenge that some folks have with, with updating uh, sort of the, the Word document version of, of the instructional plan. You know, if you need to update it, you have to, if you don't have a copy already, you got to download it, you got to edit it offline, then you got to re-upload it to, to or, or delete the existing one and upload a new one. It, it's kind of a hassle. Also, the, the template, at least in my experience, has always been a little bit laggy to edit. Um, it wasn't until I was talking to David Tierney about it. I was like, okay, this computer is not that bad. Why is it so slow to just navigate from one page to another? And he's, he, his advice was to close the file, you know, restart my computer and open it back up and the file will be fine, um, which is, again, not a great workaround if you have to restart your computer. Um, but yeah, so this is this is something that Nathan has kind of had in the works for a while, and it, it's been really uh, like a really exciting um, sort of tool that we can use. And so it's kind of pulling, you know, course information. Some of this is it's pulling from the actual like course shell that was created. 
Um, and I can get to the edit page in a second. This is just a, a very, very rough version of, of, of one of those, obviously. Uh, building out a full course in here is um, a little bit more time than we, we had to put together. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's displaying you know, the start date of the course, uh, the end date, the, the drop deadline, all really important information for students. Obviously, the, this, these dates don't really make a lot of sense because this is an impromptu sort of course for, for the purposes of tech for teaching. But um, we got some faculty information here. Uh, oh, Wesley's there now. Okay, interesting. Uh, but we, so we've got Rachel here, um, including this is pulling a photo from um, from sort of the her, like set profile uh, in 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 Econostoga. Um, this is the one that I have set on my personal uh, account. Obviously, I'm logged in with a with a higher level of access, so that actually is not showing up up here, but. Um, and then you can also, there's also a spot to include sort of your availability. So I, I put, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays, 3 to 4.30, which is when this, this workshop is running. Um, Wesley is not available at all. Um, bless his heart, he's a very busy man. Um, and then this is where you can kind of add extra notes, program notes, course specific notes. Uh, I pulled some of this content from, um, from a, a science fiction course that I worked on because Dave Bynum is a uh, being a pure light and um, he will probably be fine if I borrow some of his content to, to show it off. Um, and this is just, you know, a, a set of policies that he has in place on so you can put whatever you want, but it's again, uh, a little bit more of a, a dynamic place to put it than sort of a, a, a Word document that may or may not load consistently in Econostoga. Sometimes you get that little spinny loading screen and, and whatever. Um, this information, uh, continues to wow and astound me, which is just, um, this is pulled from the actual grade book of the course. So this is sort of the grade breakdown for, for a, a science fiction course. So there's a midterm exam, there's a short story or essay or vlog, uh, and then a final exam and some reading responses. Um, and so it's kind of saying, you know, where it's getting it from, the course tools, grades is where you can go and take a look at the, the, the grade book. Um, obviously the start and the end date, are, are pulled from, from the course shell. Um, if you have a, 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 an assignment associated with it, it will also kind of surface some of the, the information or the explanation. Um, so th this is the actual description on the submission folder. Um, and so this is also a link to a uh, instruction file, uh, assignment instruction page that doesn't exist because I haven't built it or I haven't brought it into this course shell. Um, and again, it's it's pulling that information dynamically on on the back of the course. So you want to when you when you are building your dynamic IP, you want to make sure you have your gradebook set up. You want to make sure you have some of those tool settings set up. Um, and once you kind of create it, it'll be able to pull that information. And if it's not there, it doesn't really know what to pull from. Um, and then you've got uh, some instructor only information here. And this will show kind of over time as the course progresses, this is the type of like the, the grades, the, the percentage of the grade that has been accounted for throughout the entire course. Um, and so this will show, you know, as you kind of move through and as you grade some stuff, you kind of get a sense of how much, um, what percentage of the student's final grade you kind of covered within the course shell. And this can be helpful if you're writing a, a, an announcement or something about, hey, we're at the halfway point, or hey, you, by this point in time, you've, we've kind of gotten through 40% of your final grade at this point. Um, and then this is maybe a, a good moment to send them to the, the grade calculator and then the what if stuff if they're really worried about um, how to do in the course. Uh, <laughs> this is a, a bit of a note, just sort of some of these some of these don't have dates set to them. Grade items that don't uh, that don't have dates set within it are these things, um, which again the, the the IP is is really good about just like kind of flagging the stuff to you or at least letting students know like hey there's no set date for this. Um, can I get work on this at your own pace? Um, yeah, Rob, that's probably a good point for Jennifer's question in the chat. Oh, she wants yeah. to know if it can be created in a model course and then copied over and edited by um, other teachers. Yeah. And I think we're kind of seeing some of the like, yes, but <laughs> with the dates here, right? So some of the limitations are ways that you would need to coach your teaching team to fill this out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, right now with, with the OLC, our goal is for, for any new courses that we're building, we're going to use this for our model shells. Uh, the one thing that we, we aren't doing, obviously, is setting the dates in the model shell because that's going to change every term um, and it can be a bit of a hassle. So you want to have like maybe a clean model shell and like if there's a, 
you know, one shell that you're, you're kind of prepping for, for that term, you can then have your, your, your team copy from there or, um, yeah. And, and again, we can walk through the steps to, to re-edit that stuff if we want to, um, you know, change the grade book or, or whatever, remove the grade book. Um, we can sort of, once you kind of go back into the tool, create a new pay, a new instructional plan and overwrite it, it'll overwrite that, that previous one with, with all the information. So if, for example, you're, you decide you, you want to change your grade book entirely, you go do that, you go back into the tool, generate a new IP and replace the previous one. So do the same thing. You may be able to use a step-by-step -step process where you copy, you don't have dates set in your in your model shell, you copy it into a term shell, you set all your dates, you go and you re-export the, uh, the instructional plan and you should have all those dates ready to go. Um, so you can set, if you are setting like sort of release dates for your, your, your start and end of your module, it'll pull that data. Uh, I, I'm not a huge, huge fan of locking down course content, but I, I totally get where you might want to have a, a situation where like, Hey, I want to make sure students go through this content before they move on to the rest of the course. Um, it's just release conditions can be a bit finicky in, in, in the LMS and that's largely what that is. But if, if you do have dates set for that, it'll, it'll pull that information and let students know. Um, and then it's, it'll, it'll link to, like if you can find a week one, it'll link to that module. If there's an activity in week one, it'll, it'll include information for that. If there's an evaluation, I've just, I've just thrown stuff in there. So if there's evaluations falling, with, falling within the, this date, it'll dynamically pull it out. And then obviously if there's any kind of communications, if you've set a, a calendar uh, item for, for, uh, for within, the, within the, the course, and we can show you how to, how to do that, um, it'll also pull that information and surface that to students. Um, so let's see what this page looks like if we go to the edit page. So this is pull, This is basically jumping to the Econostoga uh, instructor tools page. Uh, this would be the, the way you can kind of just get there normally is instructional plan dynamic web page. There's a demonstration video that really goes through a lot of uh, a lot of the features here. Again, I'm trying to keep this to 10 minutes, so um, there's a lot of extra features that I, I'm not getting get into all, all of them at once because a whole session could probably be built around this. Uh, and then if you get to start, if you click the get, get started button, it'll uh, sort of let you uh, get started and, and put in the org unit for your course. Um, I think actually, if you are accessing this with with regular credentials, it'll probably be it. It, you, it, it should just bring up a list of the course shells that you're an instructor in. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. The drop down menu that I saw. Yeah, Rob's looking at it with our with our special access here. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. But yes, if you're in, in a pinch, if you are ever uh, not sure what an org or an OU is, if, they, if you ever get that question asked of you, what is the org unit ID? If you go to the homepage of, of any course shell up here at the very top, you've got a uh, uh, six digit number there and you can kind of just, that's the org unit, that is the specific number that the, the LMS is assigned to this course. And so it'll use that as a uh, um, kind of a reference point, but. All right, this is, the, this is the one that I've put together. You can see that it's already pulled the course code and the course name uh, from the, the course shell, which was created you know, using um, SIS. Uh, you can pick your, your, your delivery here and that'll have, uh, I think that opens up different options for you um, if you've got different, uh, different delivery types. Um, I could do it with all my asynchronous. Um, and then there's some, some notes as you as you're kind of moving through this, right? The deck, this uh, this date represents when the course becomes visible to your students, and not necessarily the first day of synchronous meetings or classes. So obviously, about two days before the start of term, students get access to their course shells, um, and that that's the date that that is being surfaced here for the the course. Um, so this tool is assuming that the week one for it is uh, the first Monday following the start date defined above. Um, Again, that that the the version of this is, is a little bit weird because we have a it's, it's not a standard course shell, um, and then we've got sort of the the end date and the drop deadline. Um, so this the faculty information. What this is pulling for from is the class list tool uh, inside of the course shell. So it's looking at the the class list and the and the roles that have been um, 
that have been assigned to different people. So we've got Catherine Brillinger here. She is not in the session, um, but obviously, so you can you can hide the image. You can also do not display this instructor on the instructional plan. Uh, obviously, we want Rachel to show up. I took the liberty of saying when Rachel was available. Um, you can also ask it to remind me to update this available each new uh, this availability each new course offering. I'm pretty sure that just displays at the, the info bar at the top of the the, the instructional plan. Uh, we had a couple other people that had uh, instructor level access in this course shell. Um, Wesley, I think, was updated to instructor access later. Um, so I'll, I'll tweak that. Obviously, everyone's favorite, Jesslyn Wilkinson, uh, no, not teaching this one. And then we've got me. So I've just, I've just checked to not show Wesley. So I'm going to go through the process of, of resharing this so that we can see what, what the update is there. And obviously, Jason Hardy. And this is where you can kind of, you can use a, you know, you can add images, you can add, um, you know, links to other things. If there's, if you have a direct link to uh, uh, a course resource or something like that, that's a great spot to put this. Uh, and then obviously if you want to put, you know, APA at Conestoga, um, I just created a, a link here using the, sort of the text editor. You can do some basic formatting. You probably want everything left justified. If you center justified, I'd question what, whether you like your students at all. Um, and then there's, you know, you can create bulleted lists and, and and other options there as well. Uh, you can also set, you know, headers or, or block quotes. Um, and then we've got here, it's again, pulling up all that information from the, from the gradebook. What this is doing is when you reaccess this tool, it's, it's taking a look at the course shell saying, okay, we, we know this information already, let's pull this in. Um, and then you can set a start date and an end date for, for some of your assessments. Um, Again, do only set dates for this item in the space below if you don't plan to edit the dates for the associated tool within the Econostoga. So this is if you just want to surface that information for students, but you don't actually want to go in and set a start date and an end date for your submission folders. Um, if you do intend to, intend to do that, you can do that uh, inside of the, the course shell and should be able to surface that information. Uh, the, the main thing is you don't want to do that and have the, the two bits of information try to like supersede one another or clash. Um, so again, it's it's pulling up a lot of information from you know different reading responses and, and information that I've copied into this course shell. Um, you can have it display announcements. That's a little bit finicky, I think, in a non-standard course shell. But um, as you, uh, I think, in part because the announcement I created is probably inside of the the start date for the course. Um, and here you go. You've got you know week one, and it's looking for. Um, modules that you've created for, for separate uh, for separate weeks. So made a slight change here. It'll pop a little warning up saying like, hey, there's no availability information for these people. Uh, there, the start and end dates are missing for great items that you've got here. You just do a little check mark here saying, I acknowledge that some elements may be missing and I would like to publish, which is fine. And we want to replace the original. Um, and you can also reset the completion tracking, which is it, as your students are looking through the LMS, it'll check out, it'll have a little check mark for, for pages that they've seen. So they know that they've, they've seen all the content. You can reset the completion tracking for students for that page so that when they come back to whatever module, your, your course information module, your start here module that has um, your, your instructional plan, you can um, have it show that they have, there's new information for them to see. So, and then we hop back to, this course shell takes a minute to, to load up. And we see Wesley has vanished from the, the instructional plan. Oh, yeah, there we go. All right, we're at 349. So we did promise a break. Do you want to take a quick break right now and then give you folks a, a few minutes? We can come back, talk about the essential element scanner and uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll get to the summary. How's that yeah, sound? Yeah, I think that's great. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of reiterate the instructional plan. There's a lot of information there. I think the main takeaway is set up your course first before trying to generate this. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. Some great feedback. Oh, that's great. I'm IPs. glad that people are already using it. Yeah. So why don't we take about five minutes? We'll come back about 3.55. Um, and then we will kind of do a summary, give you, give you a chance to fool around, experiment with the tools while you've got us uh, for some support. So we'll see you back at 355.